I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. She winked and swirled her cocktail. I'm what you might call a search and rescue tourist. Huh? I was sure that I hadn't heard her over the jazz piano and muffled bar conversations around us. Now you heard right. She leaned in close. Come on, what do you see in the news every day? The worst side of people. Crime, corruption, selfishness. But when someone goes missing, you should see it. The whole community comes together. What are you talking about? I got certified in search and rescue years ago. And now I go wherever there's a need. Look, I've struggled with depression my whole life. Most of the time it feels like the planet is doomed. Life isn't worth living. And things are only getting worse. But when you're out there looking for somebody, sharing hugs and hot coffee and candlelight vigils, it feels like there's actually hope. I mean, you might actually be the one to rescue a person who would otherwise disappear without a trace or solve an unexplained mystery. Isn't that better than a hangover, a sunburn, and an overpriced motel? How well I remember that fateful conversation. All I'd wanted was to plan a trip with my new girlfriend, Roxanne. We had only been dating for a few weeks, and we were still sort of feeling each other out, trying to see if this thing would be a good fit. That's why I was so surprised that she mentioned her little secret. One of many, as it turned out, but that was later. And back in the cocktail bar, I was still puppy love infatuated with the geeky, unpredictable redhead across the table from me. And if she had said that her hobby was bear wrestling or digging up corpses, I probably would have gone along just as eagerly. Just like a hiker wandering off the trail or a child swimming too deep, I was entering an uncharted world where what I knew no longer applied. That's how I found myself in a tacky pine-scented cabin in Halix Point, Wyoming, buttoning up to go look for Bryce Hartford. Bryce was seven years old and 52 hours missing. Bryce's mother, Carmen, had been watching him build a snow fort in the backyard when she realized that she had left her phone inside. When Carmen returned, all that was left of Bryce was a small blue mitten hanging from the handle of a plastic shovel. Her son was gone. On the drive out to Halleck's Point, Roxanne explained to me that the families of the disappeared almost always respond in the same way, beginning with denial. Bryce must have just gone around front or come around the front door, Carmen supposes. Maybe he was even hiding on purpose. She searches the whole house before moving on to worry. Carmen starts screaming Bryce's name searching the ankle-deep snow and skeletal trees behind her house until their footprints crisscross the undergrowth. She makes calls to neighbors, her wife Abby, and finally the police, whose gloomy warnings inspire her. Panic. Dusk turns the woods blue. Officers, reporters, well-wishers, and rubberneckers come and go from the kitchen. Carmen sobs into her tea while Abby rubs her shoulders, and the mustachioed police officers Questions about unusual strangers around the house or personal enemies lead to paranoia. Carmen and Abby stare sleeplessly at the ceiling, wondering who on earth could wish evil on their sweet little boy. Overnight, rumors spread like wildfire through the small town. The outpouring of public support the next day gives the desperate family a bit of hope. Maybe Bryce just got lost in the woods. Carmen and Abby's property is bordered on three sides by the National Forest after all. And surely with all these searches and thermal imaging helicopters and handmade posters all over town, Bryce will be found, right? That hope had mostly faded by the chilly morning of our search. These searchers who had stomped through the nearby forest and sipped donated hot cocoa were a lot less eager after two days of finding nothing. The icy rain didn't help and neither did the fact that the extended search entered areas that were truly remote. The cliffs out there had an eerie, watchful quality, glowering down on the volunteers while they fought, 
icy thorn bushes and a swampy mog. When Roxanne and I pulled up to the dirt lot at the end of the forest road, each searcher's face told the same sad story. There's no way that kid is still alive. What on earth are we still doing here? We didn't say where we had come from. Carmen didn't ask. I felt like an imposter when she forced a little smile and squeezed her hands in thanks. Carmen handed us each a photo of the brown-haired, freckly gap-toothed boy and a red parka and a gray knit cap and blue mittens as well. And then she wished to luck to our sad little band. Roxanne and I, Samir and Devin, professional search and rescue agents, and the local deputy, Amos Hartford, with his knee-high boots, Smokey the bear hat, and grizzled beard. Amos looked like he had just walked out of a 60s western. All right, folks, I want a clean, thorough search. It's bad country out there, ridges, caves, valleys, easy to get turned around. Y'all make sure that you stay in sight of the searchers on either side. If you look around and don't see the next in line, blow your whistle. Then we'll pause and regroup. If you find anything or have a problem, same thing, blow the whistle. Remember, we're going a long way off the beaten track today. Lots of people go missing out there every year. Amos took a deep breath. But we find most of them. Let's not give up hope. Move out. Roxanne had insisted that I complete a training course, but what I found at Halleck's Point was nothing like it. The icy woods were too quiet, and this was no simulation. That boy might really be out there. Our lonely voices echoed from the cliffs, and I realized that I was spending more time trying not to get separated from the group than actively searching for traces of Bryce. The forest was riddled with narrow crevices full of leaves and slippery cliffs. It was all I could do to keep my footing, and each step made it obvious that if a seven-year-old fell out here, he would never be found. The first time I looked to my left and didn't see Roxanne in her bright orange vest, I panicked. Not for her, I'm ashamed to say, but for me. Although I told myself that I was keeping track of our position, the truth was that I had no idea how to get back to the forest road, and I was already sniffling and shivering despite my winter clothing. If I got left out here after nightfall, I heard four other whistles answer my call. Like magic, Roxanne and Samir appeared among the boulders up ahead. I had simply blundered into a shallow ravine that blocked visibility on both sides. Roxanne looked disappointed, Samir looked worried, and I looked like a fool. Roxanne and Samir said that it was fine and that I had done the right thing, and although I'm sure they sincerely meant it, I was furious with myself. I had cost us and Bryce precious time. I resolved not to do it again. Until I separated myself from the group again, not even an hour later, I had a good excuse, or at least I thought I did. A rustling came from the bushes ahead, and I'd swear that I saw the flash of a child-sized red parka and a gray knit cap disappear into the reeds of the swamp. I forgot all about my whistle. I gave chase. Bryce! I yelled as we had been yelling all day. I smacked away bushes, fought to unstick my boots from the marshy ground, and finally slipped into the mud as I vaulted over a rotten log. By the time that I had straggled back to where I was supposed to be, the others seemed to have been swallowed up by the cliffs. I called for Roxanne's name. I ran forward and then back until I realized that I was only getting myself more lost and time was running out. I blushed when I blew the whistle for the second time that day. Everyone came running. Even Deputy Amos and Evan from the far ends of the line. None of them said so, but I could tell they all felt annoyed and let down. Welp, Deputy Amos spat. Might as well break for lunch then. We settled onto the cold rocks to eat our cold sandwiches in a cold wind, and for the most part, we ate in silence except for Roxanne. Her conversation with Deputy Amos sounded more like an interrogation and a few parts stuck out to me later. You must not be used to this, Roxanne sighed. Halleck's Point seems like such a quiet little town. Yeah, 
Amos grunted. Mostly. Mostly, huh? Roxanne pressed. Trouble in paradise. Well, this ain't the first kid who's gone missing. There is a girl back in 97. On the other side by the cattle ranches. Just vanish into thin air. Do you think the two are related? Why? Amos finally replied after a long pause. Do you? At this, Amos gave us both a long, hard look. It felt like there was a warning in those flinting eyes. Where did you say y'all was from again? Back on our sore feet, we continued it deeper into the woods. A few hours later, however, something more than blisters was bothering me. It wasn't just that we had gone further than any seven-year-old could reasonably have gone on his own, or Deputy Amos's unsettling story about the missing girl from all those years ago. It was the time of day. Dusk came early in those broken hills. We should have turned back by afternoon, yet Deputy Amos led us silently on, almost like he already knew what we were going to find. Lost in such troubling thoughts, I didn't hear the whistles right away. Not just one, but three of them. I stood dumbly for a moment, not realizing what the shrill sound might mean. Boulders blocked my line of sight. Roxanne came running up from my left, asking what was going on. And the whistling became even more desperate and disjointed. And then it suddenly stopped. By the time that Roxanne and I scrambled up to the ridge, all sound and movement on our right had ceased. It was as though Evan, Samir, and Deputy Amos had been swallowed up by the forest. We called their names, blew our own whistles, and swept the area. To no avail, though. I asked Roxanne what she thought had happened. I asked if anything like this had ever happened during her other search-and-rescue tourist experiences. But Roxanne wasn't paying attention to me. Her eyes were fixed on a GPS in her hand. A GPS that even I could see was malfunctioning. With a frown, she returned the GPS to her backpack and then took out a waterproof bag holding a map of the area, a compass, and some fire starters. Roxanne apparently came well prepared. What do we do in a situation like this? I wondered aloud. Roxanne's expression was inscrutable as she surveyed the clifftop across the valley. We go back. It only took a few minutes for me to be stunned into silence by my girlfriend's unexplained talents. Apparently, there was a lot more to using a compass than pointing it north, and a lot more to maps than X marks the spot. Gorges and rocky slopes prevented us from moving in anything like a straight line, but I never doubted that Roxanne was leading us back home, just not quickly enough. After a few more hours of trudging, it became clear that we would be spending the night in the woods. We made camp in a small clearing, using headlamps for light and we forged for firewood and built a small lean-to from fallen logs. We dug out the bottom and used leaves and dirt for insulation. Roxanne seemed pretty on edge. She jumped at every snapping twig or rustle in the frosty undergrowth. I could understand being worried in a situation like ours, but Roxanne wasn't acting like a person who was lost. She was acting like a person being hunted. Roxanne didn't relax until the fire was lit, and she let out a deep sigh as the crackling flames warmed her boots. There was something about the orange glow that cheered me up as well. Wrapped up in Roxanne's emergency thermal blanket, with hot rocks warming our shelter, and a starry sky overhead, the whole thing felt like a big adventure. Surely, we would be back in town tomorrow and a larger team would find Deputy Amos and the others, who must have just gotten separated from us. Maybe they had even found Bryce, and Alex Point probably had some little dive bar where we would all laugh about this later. Help! A child's voice called from the darkness. I'm so cold. I wondered if exhaustion could make a person hallucinate. Surely, I hadn't heard. Help, I'm cold. Roxanne was on her feet in an instant, but she wasn't rushing toward the trees. Instead, 
She grabbed a flaming branch from the fire and pulled a pistol from the back of her jeans. What the heck was going on? Bryce! I shouted back. Bryce! came the response. Help! I'm cold! Even with the beam of my headlamp, I couldn't find the source of the voice out in the dark trees. Oh, we've got to get out of here. Shh! My girlfriend grabbed my arm. Shut up and stay put, all right. Oh, please help. I'm cold. I'm so cold. Bryce. The voice came from a few feet behind us, just outside of the firelight. We both spun around, but our shaky headlamps revealed nothing more than bare dirt. Bryce, I shouted. Don't worry, it's gonna be okay. We've been looking for you. We're friends of your mom. Mom, oh, okay. Please help, cold. Please help, please help, I'm cold. Bryce, looking for mom. What are you doing? Roxanne hissed. That isn't Bryce. Who else could it be? I almost laughed. With my headlamp bobbing, I ran into the trees toward the source of the voice. Wait, Roxanne called, but I wasn't listening. I was following my fantasies into the dark. This was my chance. Instead of being the blundering idiot who had halted the search for nothing three times and left the group, I would be the hero who actually found Bryce. More so, I thought, until I had gone so far into the underbrush that our fire was a candle flame in the distance. There was no sign of Bryce or Roxanne, and in the frigid and absolute silence I realized the depths of my mistake. It sounded like three gunshots, a strangled cry, and then silence. Panicking, I ran for the fire. Sweat poured down my face despite the chill that my heart felt like it might explode at any moment. I had regained the comforting glow of the flames, but the one who had kindled them was gone. I called for Roxanne until my throat was hoarse, but I didn't dare leave the fire. The next thing I remember was the dawn, pale and gray as the fire's ashes. I stared at them for a while, feeling shell-shocked. I didn't know how to build a fire like that, I didn't know how to read a map, and I didn't have one even if I did. I tried to follow Roxanne's footprints along the frosty ground, but quickly lost the trail. A sea of trees and rocks extended for miles in every direction. If I went the wrong way, I would probably die of exposure or starvation before I reached the edge of the woods. And whatever was going on out here was not natural. Roxanne was gone and there had been no news of Evan, Samir, and Deputy Amos either. No flare, no helicopter, no cavalry to ride in and save the day. If anyone was going to get me out of this, it was going to be me. I picked up a branch of hardwood, about right for a walking stick and about right for a club. My fingers were numb and I felt better with it in my hand. Since Roxanne had been leading us south, I headed that way as well hoping I would find a large body of water or a landmark or something that might lead me home and out of this nightmare. I called out to Roxanne, but my throat was so parched that my shout sounded more like dry, frostbitten wheezes. What could have happened to her? Had she gone off chasing Bryce or whatever it was in the trees? Had she gotten into some kind of fight? If so, why were there no scuffling footprints, no signs of a struggle? What wasn't I seeing here? The only thing I could think to do was return to Halleck's Point and alert the authorities as soon as possible and so I trudged on. The temperature dropped with every step and soon fat white snowflakes fell all around me. Around noon, I reached the bottom of a swampy ravine that I thought I recognized. The jagged cliffs and golden reeds told me that I was no more than an hour's hike from the road but something was different. A path had been smashed down through the reeds. Someone had been here recently. I was hearing my heartbeat in my ears, but I didn't know what was on the other side of that trampled mock. The reeds and brush rose higher than my head, creating a kind of tunnel. It led to the blackness of a knee-high cave, a cave that opened at the bottom of the cliffs like a toothless grin. Something, I don't know what, made me want to approach silently. No good. 
stick split underfoot with each step. And beside me came a loud crackling, followed by shrieks of two birds taking off in the reeds and nothing more. My heart was in my throat. The mouth of the cave ahead had been stuffed with logs, sticks, and leaves. It had been dug out as well. It was a kind of nest. Hello? A voice whimpered from the darkness. Hey there. Please help. Uh, I'm so cold. I stopped in my tracks. Why don't you come out of there? I asked and for some reason I felt my body tense up. Like some long forgotten instinct was getting me ready to run. Uh, okay. A brown haired boy in a red park with a single blue mitten on his hand squirmed out of the cliff face in front of me. He was pale, sniffling, scratched up and scared. But all things considered, he seemed alright. Bryce, I ventured. The boy nodded. What happened to you? Um, I don't know. Bryce shrugged. He was trembling. I just want to go home. We stared at each other for a moment, unmoving. Bryce was scoping me out to see if I was safe. And I was doing the same to him. Why was I scared of a seven-year-old boy? The boy's face was stained with dirt and mucus. His lips were almost blue. This couldn't go on. I reached out and grabbed the child's wrist. Uh, do you know the way home, mister? I can't make any promises, I smiled. But I'll do my best. The child seemed weak, but I was too. He struggled in the thick mud and gravelly cliffs, but... I didn't have the strength to carry him. We were both beyond exhaustion when I finally glimpsed the thin line of the dirt forest road, the next valley over. I gave a little wheeze of joy and hurried downhill toward the parked cars below, dragging the child behind me. We had made it. I had more cause for joy than I knew. I wasn't the only searcher who had made it back. Up ahead, I saw a figure in a hunter orange vest and a big brown hat. Deputy Amos. I waved but his back was to me and my voice was too hoarse to shout. We were atop the final ridge before the road when I finally caught up to him. The sound of the child and I crashing through the undergrowth behind made Amos turn his head. I waved again. Deputy, I gasped. I found... Amos turned slowly, his hand on the pistol at his hip. But that wasn't what made my breath catch in my throat. It was what walked beside him. The little figure had been hidden by the deputy's bulk until we got close. But now it was clearer. A little brown-haired boy in a red park with a single blue mitten. The boys whose hand I held stopped dead and grabbed my wrist. He looked at himself, standing beside Deputy Amos and then looked up at me. His eyes were big with confusion and fear. And then everything happened at once. The Bryce beside Amos let out an inhuman howl and shoved the deputy, who tumbled off the cliff. His arms windmilled helplessly as he fell. Gunshots rang out from the silent woods behind me, and the Bryce thing fled, whooping into the trees. Crap! I heard Roxanne yell. She ran up to me, hands wrapped in a professional grip around her pistol. I told you that wasn't Bryce. I'm Bryce. The boy holding my hand at it helpfully. He looked nervously at Roxanne's weapon. So that means you're not going to shoot me, right? Right. Roxanne smiled grimly. I'm not going to shoot you, kid. What we've got to do now is get you home. We crept up to the cliff edge to see what could be done for Deputy Amos, but it was useless. He lay at the bottom of the 90-foot precipice, long hair spread out behind his shattered head like a silver halo. I covered Bryce's eyes before he could peer over the edge. All around us, the hills echoed with strange noises. They were identical to the sound the Bryce thing had made, a weird mix of a whoop and a howl. Roxanne covered Bryce and I as we made the last slog to the cars. Those howls made it seem like the things were everywhere, but I couldn't see anything but narrow trees and rocks. The overcast dusk didn't help any matters. It turned everything to shades of bluish gray, except for the occasional points of light between the pines that 
might or might not have been eyes. Roxanne stuffed Bryce into the back of her car and started the engine the moment that we had reached the road. Her tires spun in the dirt as we pulled out. In the mirror behind us, I saw two shadowy figures running out of the woods behind us. They looked like Samir and Evan, and Roxanne guessed my thoughts. If it's really them, they can drive back after us. If not, there are things that can only leave the forest if someone invites them. You've got a lot of explaining to do, I rasped, pouring water down my throat. Maybe, Roxanne nodded, but let's get back to town first. We bumped and rattled down the narrow dirt road that led through that world of cliffs and endless trees. Bryce dozed fitfully in the back seat, his tiny hand wrapped around the half-eaten energy bar that I had given him. It would be more than miles before I fell asleep. Snow was falling when we skidded into the police station parking lot. The yellowish lights spilling in its doors and windows were the only lights still on in the tiny town of Halex Point. My girlfriend Roxanne had much more experience with search and rescue than I did, and so it was she who lifted the sleeping child from her back seat and carried him into the tiny station to offer our grim report. Still exhausted from my harrowing experience in the winter woods, I limped in after her and tumbled into the first chair that I saw. The first thing we heard was a low, visceral moan. Bryce! Carmen burst from the back office to throw her arms around her child. Bryce struggled grumpily as Carmen held him to her chest, sobbing. The boy had been missing for over 72 hours, considering the freezing weather and the cruel terrain. I suspect that even his mother had given up hope. He's probably a little hungry and dehydrated, but he mostly seems alright. Roxanne informed her. He then leaned around her, directing her next words to the sheriff. He'll need to be checked for frostbite, among other things. Amos, Sheriff McCauley asked gruffly. The deputy didn't make it. Searchers Samar Patel and Evan Pickett are also missing. Not oh, Jesus. Macaulay leaned back in his worn-out rolling chair and stroked his stubble. My department isn't prepared to handle this. Heck, my department wasn't prepared to handle one missing kid. I'm gonna have to call this in. Carmen, honey, you think you can run the old Bryce over to the hospital yourself? Carmen nodded, still too choked up to speak. As she laughed, Roxanne put a hand on her shoulder. No stops. I heard my girlfriend murmur, straight to the hospital. I know it looks bad out there, but don't pick up any hitchhikers no matter who they are. Uh, okay. Well, thank you both again so much. Once things are calmer, Abby and I would love to do something special to show our appreciation. You saved our son's life. With a last concerned look over her shoulder at us, Carmen with her son vanished into the night. I'm sorry, Sheriff McCulley sighed, but I'm going to have to ask you folks to head back to wherever you're staying as well. And don't think we're not grateful. You heard this woman. That boy's alive and well because of all you. But things are about to get a real crazy around here. Man, I don't got time or the space. We understand, Roxanne cut in. We're pretty beat and we'll be heading back to Point Lodge if you need us for anything. After roughly marking the locations of Deputy Amos's body and the other searchers' disappearance on the sheriff's map, Roxanne drove us back to our kitschy pine cabin at the Point Lodge Motel. Now I'd like to say that I helped Roxanne secure and lock up the cabin, or demanded an explanation for these strange things I had experienced during Bryce Hartford's rescue. The truth is, is that I faceplanted onto the nearest bed and fell asleep without even taking off my boots. The last thing I remember was Roxanne peering out of the people at the snowy nighttime parking lot while she locked the door, pistol in hand. The news was on when I woke up. Roxanne sat at the corner of the bed with a styrofoam cup of coffee in hand, staring intently at the screen. You're up, Roxanne smiled. Finally, I'm gonna go wash off. 
She pushed her pistol into my hand. You've used one of these before, right? If anyone tries to come in here, you know what to do. With that, she grabbed a fluffy towel off of the radiator and turned on the shower. You're kidding, right? I called after her. Right? No response. The cold metal felt heavy and unfamiliar in my hand. I sighed and tried to focus on the television. But each time I saw movement on the other side of the transparent curtains, I expected some awful thing to come for us. I didn't even know what I was afraid of. The boogeyman, maybe. Some big, shadowy figure that would smash through the flimsy pine door and drag us away to dark places. Finished with her shower and dressed in PJs, Roxanne came back to the bed. Helicopter views of the wilderness we had trudged through played on all the local channels. Deputy Amos' death was the top story, along with our disappeared fellow search and rescue volunteers, Samir and Evan. Samir and Evan, I grunted. I thought I saw them on the edge of the trees just before we left. You saw something at the edge of the trees, Roxanne clarified. Something that might have looked like Samar and Evan, but it wasn't. With one last a nervous look at the door, I gave Roxanne her pistol back. What aren't you telling me? I demanded. Why does a search and rescue volunteer need a gun? My girlfriend looked thoughtfully at the pistol and then sighed. She seemed to have made up her mind about something. I didn't expect to encounter them on your first search, Roxanne explained. I thought that I would have more time to train you in the basics of survival and navigation. So you would already be used to it when, well, it doesn't matter now. You've seen them now and there's no going back. Maybe this is for the best. It might make what I'm about to tell you a little easier to swallow. An 11-year-old girl and her family stopped for lunch at a secluded mountain lake. Seems like a perfect spot. Mom can back her SUV almost down to the shore. Dad has a view of the mountains while he barbecues off the tailgate with his portable grill. While her parents fix lunch, the girl goes for a swim. She rolls her eyes when her parents make her bring a flotation device. They wouldn't let her even dip a toe in without one. There are rumors of a strong currents and deep pits beneath the cheerful, bright blue water. At first, mom and dad look up any time they heard their daughter squeal or scream. After a while, though, they dismiss it with a knowing smile. She's a preteen girl after all, splashing around in water so cold and clear she can see the fish beneath her toes. She is thrilled by the place and swims further out than she probably meant to. Clear as the water is, she couldn't see the bottom beneath her kicking feet. It's just a bottomless azure abyss. She suddenly remembers her parents' warning about pits and currents and glances nervously toward the shore. Her parents are gone. She blinks and pinches herself, but it doesn't change the empty shore in front of her. They wouldn't just leave her. There has to be an explanation. She calls out for them, swimming toward where the SUV had been parked for all she was worth. When she comes to shore, splashing, there's no sign that the car had ever been there. Not even tire tracks on the dusty dirt road. There's not a single sound or sign of life anywhere. The girl begins to panic. She tries to backtrack down the dirt road, but is stopped by a four-way intersection she doesn't recognize. She had been too busy looking out the window on the drive up to remember all the turns that the SUV had made. By now, the gravel has shredded her bare feet, and a cold wind blows in front of the sun. The girl begins to seriously wonder if she'll make it out alive. And then she hears a voice. Honey, is that you? It comes from the woods, and it sounds exactly like her mother. The girl responds excitedly and pursues the voice deep into the woods. She doesn't notice how it eggs her on. We're over here, honey. Just a little bit further. She jumps over moldy logs and climbs through rocky gullies until she no longer knows where the road or even the lake could be. Soon, she's standing in front of the black mouth of an enormous sinkhole. Ferns hang over its mossy leaves. Dew drips into a damp darkness that 
doesn't seem to have a bottom. She peers over the edge. Stay right there. I I'm coming to get you. That's what it takes for the girl to realize that the voice she's hearing isn't her mother. And despite her aching feet, she flees, trying to find the road. But it's just trees, trees and more trees. She doesn't even know which direction she's running in. She sees a clearing up ahead and leans against a boulder for a breather. Until she sees her mom and dad on the opposite side of the trees, beckoning her encouraging her to step back beneath the shadow of the trees. She takes off, but she twists her ankle before she even escapes the clearing. She screams. She grabs a muddy stick and uses it to propel herself further, away from the grinning faces and the sing-song voices. She makes it as far as a broken slope of rust-covered rocks. Although her mind is terrified, her body just can't keep moving. She falls into the dust. She sobs and wails like she's never done before, but also she prepares. She drags herself toward one of the bigger rocks and covers herself with dirt, twigs, stones, anything she can find to keep the wind off and keep her head in. Her teeth chatter until they ache. The shelter and coverings that she made protect her from hypothermia, just barely. She drifts off to the sound of unearthly voices, calling her name beneath unfamiliar stars. When she wakes up, it's daylight again. The girl still hears her name shouted into the wind, but this time it's different. For one, the person yelling isn't anyone that she knows. It's a pot-bellied guy with a black beard and a hunter orange jacket. He looks around carefully, and then he picks his nose. He tries to wipe his booger on his boot, trips, curses, and then kicks the rock that almost made him fall. That's how the girl knows that he's human. She tries to respond to him, but her throat is choked with dust. She tries to run to him, falls and crawls instead. She pulls herself up onto a boulder, waving her hands, but his back is to her. Out of options, she hurls a rock at him. It doesn't go far but the tiny rock slide that it creates makes him turn around. He meets the girl's gaze and then calls something in on his shortwave radio. Later, the girl finds out that the search and rescue team, the big bearded man is a part of, wasn't even looking for her or at least not only her. They were looking for the girl's parents who were reported missing by her dad's co-worker a few days ago. The girl is confused. According to the bearded man and his rugged-looking pals, four days had passed, but for the girl, it had been less than 24 hours. One thing, however, is certain. The girl's parents are nowhere to be found. She wonders about what happened to them. Was their experience like her own? Were they called into the woods by her voice? Led up to some dark pit and finally, what? Killed? Eaten? Taken somewhere else? transformed into something else. The fact is, the more she tries to tell her story to the search and rescue team, the more muddled it becomes, until not even the girl is sure what happened. The image of that black hole in the deep woods grows larger and larger in her mind, until its blackness blots out everything else. I went to a dark place, she tells police and researchers, until even she believes it. The girl swam too far out, and her parents got lost looking for her. That was the official version. And for many years, the girl convinces herself that it's true. But nightmares, hypnosis, regression therapy, and other stranger methods lead her back to the truth. Something unexplainable happened at that lake, and it might have happened to other people as well. Roxanne took a deep breath and then shot a Dixie cup of water like it was whiskey. Her story was definitely weird, but I didn't see what it had to do with Bryce's disappearance until... I was that girl, Roxanne murmured. Summer of 98. We had our whole lives ahead of us. Teardrops appeared on the cheesy black bear print quilt. I held her. That's what got you into this, I reasoned. You became a search and rescue volunteer to figure out what happened to your parents. I've done search and rescue for 15 years now, and I still don't have any answers. 
I still don't know how the thin places work. Thin places, I probed. That's just what I call them, Roxanne snapped. They show up everywhere if you're looking for them. Different cultures at different times. It shows up again and again. This idea that there are spots where whatever divides our realities from other realities is weak. Thin places are spots where it's possible to pass through to other places. And maybe things from there can cross over as well. And, uh, I peeked out the curtains at the endless rows of ridges and pine trees. Do they always show up in places like this? Look, thin places often seem to show up on remote patches of government land. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or not. I'm not sure if they're drawn somehow to desperate people and empty spaces. I'm not sure if they're open or closed, move or stay still. I put so much of my life into this, and it's like I haven't made any progress at all. Roxanne stood and paced angrily around our tiny room. You saved Bryce, I whispered. Probably a lot of other people too. Okay, fine, Roxanne admitted. But what about me? Where is my happy ending? When do I get to see my parents walk out of the woods and hug them till the paramedics separate us? When do I at least get some closure? Her shouts ended. The silence deepened. That was a mistake. I never should have brought anyone with me. Why don't we go now? I interjected. What? You say that the thin places seem to be too way right. And if Samar and Evan, or the things pretending to be them, are still running around out there, the gateway must still be open. So let's go. Not to rescue anyone, not to bring back proof. Just to see if there's anything we can learn about what happens to people who end up there. People like your parents. How long have I known you again? Roxanne crossed her arms skeptically. Look, I appreciate the gesture, but I don't really think you understand what you're offering. I mean, even if we find a way to cross over, it's pretty likely that neither of us will make it back. It's crazy, I know. I bent over, repacking my gear and tossing Roxanne the keys. Which is why we better get out there before I change my mind. It was an odd feeling, trying to find the place where we had been lost before. As Roxanne parked along the side of the dirt road where we had searched for Bryce, my eyes drifted to the tree line. I remembered how the things that looked like our friends had lingered there, just beyond the reach of light. How their eyes seemed to glow as red as the taillights as we fled. The hunt for our missing companions, Samir and Evan, continued. But from where we stood, even the helicopter sounded far away. Instead of the coughs and curses and shouts of the other searchers, there was only a heavy silence that felt like an extra weight in my pack. Roxanne and I talked about our gear, our intended path, the sweat on our butts and even the weather. Anything to avoid mentioning the thin places. Anything to avoid imagining our goal. The forest, however, wouldn't let me forget. Every rustle in the undergrowth or clatter of stones from a cliff set my teeth on edge. Roxanne had done search and rescue enough to distinguish important sounds from unimportant ones. I apparently had not. That first day, we made camp in good spirits, although I didn't feel comfortable navigating alone. I was starting to get the hang of the compass and the map. Roxanne was quiet and thoughtful. I figured that, like me, she had never gone out this far without a crew before. Huddled against Roxanne in my sleeping bag that night, I found myself hoping that things would go like this until our supplies ran out. What if we never found anything, then just returned home and put all of this behind us? We set out with the dawn in a gray haze. Damp rocks and ferns, white mist, and the loomish, greenish-black shadows of pine trees. That was our whole world. The fog had an odd way of muffling sound. I thought that I heard deer grunting behind me, but when I turned, I only saw a wall of white. A while later, Roxanne pointed out three deer in the distance. They all stood stock still, observing us. Maybe it was just a trick of the mist. 
but I'd swear the deer stood up on two legs and walked off after we had passed by. Maybe it was the fog that interfered with Roxanne's GPS equipment. We hadn't been dating long, but I recognized that face she made when she scrunched up her eyebrows and scrutinized the little device. It was the face of someone who just added 2 plus 2 and got 5. Is there a problem? I asked. We were standing in a trellis patch of knee-high ferns. The mist had lifted, but the bits of sky beyond the trees were still a sea of gray. GPS is malfunctioning, Roxanne grunted. It's happened before, usually when we're... Close, I finished. Yeah. Our little conversation felt swallowed up by the sighs and silence of the woods around us. Roxanne took a deep breath, checked her map and compass and trudged forward. We had gone a long way by the time we realized that the compass couldn't be trusted either. I stared stupidly at the needle while it spun freely. Roxanne and I scanned the trees around us for a direction, a landmark, anything. Until our eyes settled on Samir's hunter orange jacket. Hung high on several branches with the arms extended. It looked like the torso of a crucified man. Who or what had put it up there, I wondered. And why? Let's keep moving. Roxanne tugged at my sleeve. I don't know about you, but I don't relish the idea of spending the night with that thing hanging over us. She was right. It was already dusk and a twisted ankle could be fatal out here. Roxanne headed uphill, hoping to find an open ridge where we might get our bearings. It would have to wait until the morning though, because stars were twinkling overhead by the time that we found a spot to camp. They're beautiful, aren't they? I sat looking into the cosmos above us. It's like you don't really see the night sky until you come out to a place like this, you know. That's because this isn't our night sky, Roxanne sighed, not even turning away from the tent that she was setting up. What? I know how to navigate by the stars. Those aren't our stars. I felt the blood rush to my face. But don't be afraid. Roxanne went on. I'm not a kid anymore. This time, we came to this place by choice, wherever it is. We can leave the same way. We have to believe that. Do you believe it? I do, I nodded. I didn't. Well, then let's get some sleep, because from this point on, I don't know what we're going to find. The next morning, it was what I couldn't find that made me panic. Where was Roxanne? I had a fuzzy memory of her rustling around in the dark, slipping away outside of the tent. The sky was still gray. Nothing but trees and stony ridges as far as the eye could see. And no Roxanne. The wind whipped around me and I shouted her name. What? Roxanne emerged from behind a tree, pulling up her pants. You look like you've seen a ghost. No, it's just... I trailed off. Something was bothering me, but what? I could have put my finger on it. Nothing, I guess. Let's keep moving. Roxanne and I usually discussed her route, but not that day. She set off downhill so quickly that I struggled to keep up. Where are we going? You'll know it when you see it. Roxanne snapped. I got some idea of what she meant as we walked. The landscape was subtly changing as we walked. Instead of rugged mountains, it was taking on the shape of what might be found around a California lake. A lake like the one where Roxanne's parents had disappeared to. Gray rocks turned to a dusty red. Tall pines were replaced by shrub and cacti. Roxanne, what's going on? I shouted over gusts of arid wind. We're getting close. I could barely hear her reply over gusts of arid wind. They seemed to come from everywhere all of a sudden, pushing us forward toward a cave. A black hole surrounded by dripping ferns, the nightmarish pit from Roxanne's story. If it was really Roxanne leading me here, I froze. Back at the campsite, had I checked to be sure that it was really her and not something else? Suddenly I wasn't so sure. 
Roxanne pressed ahead, but I lingered, wondering if I had made a terrible mistake. Found you. I jumped and spun and slipped on a wet root, and nearly fell into Samar's chest. He gave me a big grin. Why was he still wearing his orange vest? We had seen it, name tag and all hanging from a tree. Found you, Samar said again, his smile widening. Found you. Three pistol shots. Samar's head had split like a melon. I screamed. Roxanne had just killed someone, or had she? Samar, or the thing that looked like him, didn't seem to be bothered by having his head blasted in half. It stood there patiently, repeating the same words over and over while smoking bits of skull and brain matter dripped down its visible throat. Teeth fell out of its shattered jaws it spoke, but it didn't stop. Found you, found you. Its shrieking gurgle reached a fever pitch that echoed all around us. I looked down at its hands. The fingers splintered, and then shot towards us. Some shooting through the air like vines. Others slithering along the dirt for our legs like obscene snakes with dirty fingernail faces. Run! Roxanne shouted, firing two more useless shots into the thing's chest. As it lurched forward, I felt one of its freakishly long fingers slither around my ankle. I moaned, stopped, and kept sprinting, although I could see that it was hurting us toward the pit. Its dark abyss beckoned to us both. It was the feeling that I had had many times before standing on a high ledge. That little voice that whispers to jump and see what might happen, magnified by a thousand. It was like the land itself was shifting, sucking us in. Roxanne, running a bit ahead of me, noticed it first. The feeling that the ground beneath our feet had become too steep to turn or halt our descent. Her red ponytail flashed for a second as she spun, mouth open to warn me. And then she was gone, devoured by the blackness. I couldn't have stopped even if I wanted to. I grabbed at stray roots and plants, but my fingers slipped away. I was in free fall. All light had disappeared. And then I was out again. Somehow walking up the same impossible slope that I had just fell down, into the same bizarre clearing. The weird physics of it all made me so dizzy that I fell to my knees on the damp ground. Treetops were spinning overhead. I shut my eyes tight. When I opened them again, the colors felt wrong. The air tasted different and I wasn't alone. Ahead of me, Roxanne too grabbed at fistfuls of dirt and raged. A familiar looking figure watched over her. So familiar. She looked like a slightly older version of Roxanne, her mother, and a slim, mustached man in plaid, her father. If their clothes and age were any indicator, the pair hadn't changed at all since they had disappeared. I've, I've come back, Roxanne said, to rescue you. Rescue us? Roxanne's mother laughed. No, it is we who are rescuing you. Darling, Roxanne's father explained kindly. Where you're from, your body will grow old, get sick, and die. You're bound to one form. Here, there is no death, only endless rebirth. That's why we always search for and rescue those who are lost on the other side. Roxanne's mother went on. To bring them here, where our forms are infinite. As she spoke, her torso stretched horribly, extending like a giant centipede rearing to strike. Mossy antlers grew from the back of his skull and her face warped into a nightmarish blend of human and deer. Her father's body changed as well, splitting into three like a folding paper cutout. The tendrils that connected his three parts squimmed and writhed like maggots and rotten fruit. We could hear bones snapping and watch the dark flowing blood. But the two things in front of us seemed completely unbothered by their transformation. And that wasn't all. I realized that the entire glade in which we stood was alive and conscious. The ferns and leaves stood on end, quivering with anticipation. Perhaps to consume what was left after the things that had been. Roxanne's parents had finished with us. The trees too creaked and leaned forward hungrily, 
old men bending over their dinner table. Winged things settled onto the branches and other, less describable forms twisted themselves out of the mossy ground. The ground. Even the dirt beneath our feet was shifting, closing the gap to the world that we had come from. Roxanne's parents' speech and transformation had just been a ruse to distract us while the way was shot. I staggered forward on the uneven living terrain, grabbed Roxanne's hand, and hurled myself toward the closing pit. The pit had been enormous, but it was barely shoulder-wide when I passed through, even tighter for Roxanne. Dirt closed in around us, and I felt Roxanne's wrist slipping through my fingers. I clawed in the powder dirt in front of me and realized that the physics had changed. I was clawing up instead of down. Spitting and hacking, I pulled myself into the ferny grove and did what I could to dig Roxanne out. I had barely cleared room for her to breathe when I felt something wrap around my ankle and pull. The forest wasn't letting us go. Whatever had grabbed me also had Roxanne. Her green eyes widened as she was dragged back into the loose earth. I watched her twist and flail as she disappeared. The grasp on my ankle released. I screamed my girlfriend's name and dug at the loamy soil, but she was gone, swallowed up by the other side. I dug until my fingernails were black and bleeding, until I had no strength left in my arms and I rolled over, filthy and exhausted, to stare up at a cloudy sky that was only just beginning to clear. It's you. Samara's voice caused me to flip and climb up to my feet, ready to run, but the man in front of me was as filthy as I was and not wearing his orange jacket. Evan limped behind him, his leg in a lashed together wooden splint. Uh, feels like we've been out here for weeks, man, Evan grunted, and then he soon noticed for the first time that I was alone. Uh, where's the rest of your crew? I punched the dirt and cried. Without Samar and Evan's help, I'm sure that I would have died out there. None of us knew the way back, but whatever was affecting the area had dissipated enough for our instruments to slowly begin to work. The GPS signal was still spotty and the compass needle drifted more than it should, but they were accurate enough to get us back to the forest road. From there, we were spotted by the helicopter, and soon Samar and Evan were answering local reporters' questions about their harrowing experience. I hung back on purpose. I didn't have the heart to talk to anyone, and all I asked from the rest of the search and rescue crew was that they dropped me off at Roxanne's car, which fortunately, I had my own keys to. As I opened the car door, I tried to shut out the image of all the memories we had shared in her second-hand car, but I was surprised to see an envelope with my name on it in the driver's seat. If you're reading this, it means that I'm gone. Don't think of it as an end. Think of it as the beginning. You see, I didn't get involved in search and rescue to find my parents. I did it to find my way home. I don't remember what I was before I took on that little girl's appearance and memory. Something went wrong in the transformation. I forgot my purpose, what I was. I even forgot about the thin places. Fortunately, those search and rescue volunteers invited me in, and I was able to keep up the act though this place and body had never really felt like my own. I searched blindly for many years until I rediscovered the truth. When beings like you are lost, alone, or desperate, you create the thin places yourselves. Your subconsciousness calls out to them, and I needed one of you. The more time I spend close to the thin places, the more I feel like what I truly am. Where I'm from, we don't have concepts of love or guilt or gratitude, so consider this a kind of gift. Forget me. Forget search and rescue. And stay away from lonely places. They might just invite you in. Yours, Roxanne.